Sly 2 Band of Thieves is a PlayStation 2 classic. Released by Sucker Punch in 2004, this beloved sequel took the platforming stealth genre to the next level. With settings taking place all over the world, memorable villains, and the ability to play as all three Cooper Gang members, the game is held in high regard as one of the all-time greats for the console. With any great game, people will eventually attempt to speedrun it and push the limits to see how fast it can be beaten. In Sly 2, the history goes very deep for all the game's individual episodes, and no episode is as optimized as the first one. This is the world record history of Sly 2's most iconic episode. Episode 1, The Black Chateau. Psst. Hey kid, I just had the shave of a lifetime. And you know what? I feel like a brand new pair of eyeballs. You should try it too, with Manscaped. What I was using was the new Lawn Mower 4.0, a waterproof trimmer with skin safe technology that reduces those pesky nicks and cuts. It's got a wireless charging station and goes up to 90 minutes. And it glows, telling you how much you got left. You can lock the trimmer by pressing the front button three times. Great for traveling. Something I do when I'm not in this room all day. If you use Manscaped, you'll also be accompanied by a deodorant and a ball toner. Perfect for my humongous pair. Of eyeballs, of course. Get Manscaped today with 20% off your order with free international shipping and two free gifts by using code RIXA on manscaped.com. Thanks again for sponsoring. Let's get to the video. So let's get the obvious out of the way. If you've played Sly 2 or watched anyone speedrun it, you'll know that the game is really, really long. Completing all eight episodes in the game in a single sitting can take up your entire day, and thus, Full game speedrunning for Sly 2 wasn't popular in the early days. Instead, people focused more on individual episode runs, since the length was a lot more favorable. So if one wanted to start out by speedrunning episode 1, where would they have to start? Well, let's take a look. Sly 2's gameplay is centered around completing jobs, with markers scattered across the world that starts each one, kinda like the mission markers in GTA. The different jobs are spread across several days, where we eventually work our way to the operation. In order to speedrun Sly 2 in the quickest manner, the goal is to complete every job swiftly, while minimizing time spent traveling to the next one, and avoid guard detection while you're at it. So let's take a look at the jobs for episode 1. The start to each episode always takes the form of a reconnaissance day, a day zero of sorts. Day zero only contains two jobs, satellite sabotage, which involves activating three satellites around the map, and breaking and entering, which has us fight a bunch of rats in a wine cellar with Murray, and take some photos. Day one starts with Bug Dimitri's office, which has us carry a bugged painting to swap it with Dimitri's real painting, so we can listen in on his conversations. Next up is Follow Dimitri, which is where we get our first proper look at our episode one antagonist. Dimitri's been printing fake money using the clockwork tail feathers, which is our goal to steal at the end of the episode. To get there, we have to tail him around in this job to see what he's up to, and as we learn, he's a bit of a character. For the final job of day one, we have to go back to the safe house to swap to Murray for water pump destruction, a short and simple job where we have to destroy the city's main water pump by throwing guards into the machine. Day two starts out with Murray once again, his job, Silence the Alarms, has us destroy three alarms spread across the map by throwing whatever's around us into them three times each. Theater Pickpocketing has Sly go into the theater to steal six keys. He then uses them to slow the fans down in the room so he can reach the chandelier at the top, where he uses a turret to disable some of the security. Moonlight Rendezvous is basically just an auto-scroller, where we follow Neela around the map without falling too far behind. And lastly for day two is Disco Demolitions, a Bentley job where we have to blow up four separate pillars to send the giant disco ball to its demise. For the third and final day, it's time for the episode's conclusion, Operation Thunderbeak. This has the entire Cooper gang involved and starts out with Bentley and Murray, where we have to access the water tower by defeating some rats. Bentley gets yeeted up there by Murray and blows a hole to the entrance. 
Once inside, we turn five valves, and this shuts off the water fountain in the main area. A guard has been sent out to get a repair truck, but Sly steals the key and hands it off to the others. Sly then climbs the giant peacock to prepare to catch the hook from the stolen truck. Guards then start swarming the truck, and we have to defend it and defeat them all. Concluding the rat brawl, the hook pulls down the giant peacock and it smashes a hole in the fountain, where we can access the printing room. This is where we get to square off against Dimitri, and it's also where we get to learn about his, uh, interesting way of speaking. We can... What is this with clocks, bro? Show your bling and let me shine you. I have no idea what you're saying. Once the final hit has been dealt, that would be time for episode one. The earliest history of Sly 2's speedrunning dates back to this Speed Demos archive thread created in January 2008. Prominent runners at the time, like Michael Yama, Trihex, and RJ Waters, were showing interest in a full game Sly 2 segmented run. Another pretty well known runner, Samurai Man, would post some small shortcuts in episode times. All of these videos don't exist today, but we can see that Samu had claimed a time of 32 minutes using the in game timer for episode 1. The in-game episode timer for Sly 2 is quite a bit faster than real-time, and wouldn't really be used in the following years, so... not much to gather from this claim. Another runner called Cooper Crisp decided to take on the task of completing a full game segmented 100% run. He did so, and it was submitted to SDA in 2012. And just to show you that I wasn't bluffing earlier when I said this game was long, Cooper's run was done in 54 segments, with his time of 6 hours, 38 minutes. I won't be going very in-depth on this run, since it's a 100% run, and there were practically no strat developments for Episode 1. Cooper played on the PS3 version of the game, which saved time throughout, mainly due to faster loading times. While not an extravagantly mind-blowing run, it was nice to know that people were interested in running the game. The year 2012 also marked a significant change for speedrunning as a whole. Speed Demos Archive was the primary website in the mid-2000s for speedrun submissions and strategy discussions through their forums but times were changing. Along comes Speedruns Live, where speedrunning would see a big boost in activity. The front page of SRL had a massive list of people streaming runs of various games, which paved the way for the Twitch era. Amongst other things, the success of GDQ events was putting speedrunning more in the spotlight, and thanks to Twitch's easy-to-use export feature, the scene would also get a good amount of exposure on YouTube. Communities for several games were starting to form through SRL and Twitch. Eventually, Skype calls would take place for racing, strat hunting, and just for hanging out with people you had a common interest with. With this big shift in the scene, the Sly community was taking form, and a small group of people had their sights on speedrunning Sly too. A glitch hunter named Z would help the community with their endeavors. Cooper Crisp from the SDA days was still around. Mikkel, primarily a Sly 1 runner, was interested in optimizing and racing Sly 2. And GameCuber, who I'll get to in a bit. Cooper had tried doing some episode 1 runs around this time. These times don't have surviving video, but he did post his splits on the SDA forums for the world to see. A 3936 on Christmas Eve 2013, a 3911 in March of 2014, and a 3828 the very next day. The lack of video wouldn't be too big of an issue, as only half a year later, GameCuber would be the first person who would give episode 1 the love it deserved. In August of 2014, Cuber would absolutely smash Cooper's run, when he got this time. Throughout pretty much every single job, Cuber had some kind of optimization or new strategy over the intended way. On Satellite Sabotage, Cuber realized the activation hitbox for the satellites are insanely big, and thus, you can press circle on them way earlier than you think. On Breaking and Entering, Cuber lets Murray do most of the work with the rats, as he kills them in two hits rather than Sly's four hits. After each day in the episode, a slideshow cutscene plays where Bentley briefs the gang about the next set of jobs that need to be completed. Cuber skips all three of these by quitting out to the PS3 menu and relaunching the game, saving him massive amounts of time. 
He utilized a shortcut on Bug Dimitri's office that was found by Samurai Man in 2008, where you can reach this rope from the lamp, skipping a decent chunk of platforming and getting you to the ventilation shaft earlier. Instead of walking all the way back from Dimitri's office to the next job, Cuber goes into the pause menu to load his file. Four seconds later, and the game spawns him in the safe house, skipping the travel entirely. This would also be done after the completion of two other jobs, Follow Dimitri and Theater Pickpocketing. On Silence the Alarms, Cuber made an observation as he approached the second alarm. Only two briefcases. Looks like I gotta use a guard. It's gonna be you, douchebag. The amount of briefcases that spawn in this area is seemingly random. A maximum of four briefcases can spawn, but in the worst case scenario, you can end up with zero, forcing you to use the guards or this newspaper box located all the way in the back. Murray walks a lot slower when he carries stuff over his head, so you do need some good luck here to get a fast time. On the operation, Cuber had a handful of new tricks up his sleeve. After getting tossed up to the water tower by Murray, he tanks a bomb hit to avoid having to get thrown up to the tower a second time. When stealing the key to the repair truck, he does a stealth slam combo on the first rat to instantly take him down, and then runs back to the rooftop and knocks the second rat off the building, which instantly kills him too. Now his alert level completely disappears, and he can jump down and steal the key. Oh, and when you have to climb the giant peacock, Cuber does this. We did it. The community coined this cock strats, because you climb the peacock and stuff, you know? Moving on, there's a spot on this pipe where the game takes over and climbs all the way to the beak on its own, but if you hit the trigger without being attached to the pipe, the game will launch slide to that position. Cuber's strategy for fighting the rats is to hit them as quickly as possible once their invincibility period runs out. Fairly straightforward stuff. Cuber took the Dimitri fight a little bit safe, as he wanted to close out a new world record. And so he did with 3325 on August 27th, 2014. In the following weeks, Cuber would improve his time and cement his status as the best Episode 1 player. On September 1st, 2014, Cuber would improve to a 3312, then to 3246 on September 8th, refining his movement and overall gameplay. Z, Cooper, Crisp, and Mickle had been helping Cuber out from the sidelines by finding new strategies along the way. Cuber would use the new stuff to knock his time down by another 10 seconds two days after his 3246 to 3236. The first new trick that was incorporated was discovered by Z and Cooper Crisp, and was a pretty big one. Guard spawn manipulation. By turning the camera in specific directions as you're roaming the map, you can prevent guards from spawning in your way. The majority of the time, the camera has to be backwards, which means you need to know the level layout pretty well. This trick is very useful on Bug Dimitri's office, since if you get hit by any of the guards with the painting on your back, you instantly fail the job. The way Cuber enters theater pickpocketing in this run is also faster. As discovered by Z, the job trigger extends out below the balcony, allowing you to hit it from underneath. Inside the job, there's also a couple of things to note. First, Cuber gets a faster cutscene at the start of the job that saves about 1.5 seconds. When you first go through the door, the game will take control over Sly and walk him forward to a predetermined location, kind of like the peacock climbing in the operation. The cutscene trigger is located around here, and sometimes Sly will walk all the way from the door to the trigger, but sometimes he stops a little short, thus not watching the cutscene as early as possible. Mikkel found a tiny optimization for getting the first key faster. Instead of hopping along the seam on the left like before, you can rush to the first table and quickly crawl under it to lose detection. And finally, Cuber would reach the fourth key quicker by doing a set of tricky jumps. In the meantime, Cooper Crisp wanted to get back in shape and set a good time with the new strategies. He would snag the world record by 4 seconds with 32.32 on November 30th, 2014. Unfortunately again, no video. This record would stand going into 2015, where we would see a big shift in the Sly 2 scene. Up until this point, the North Americans, Cuber and Cooper Crisp, were the ones to sit atop the throne for Episode 1. But now, all eyes turn to Scandinavia, as a Norwegian runner would have a meteoric rise to the top. And this guy was ahead of the pack.
Gnist would become one of the most important runners for Sly Speedrunning at the time, and came out swinging hard. While his first episode one time was a 3651, four minutes behind Cuber and Cooper Crisp, it only took him a week and a half to take the world record to European soil, with 3219. This run was mind-blowing for the community, as it came with a plethora of new strats, and also movement tech. The first advanced movement technique that Gnist was using was the square boost. By running forward and pressing X and square at the same time, Sly will lunge forward with his aerial attack. Movement speed in the air is significantly slower than on the ground, but this technique allows you to preserve your grounded speed into a jump, saving tiny bits of time throughout the episode. Another technique Gnist was taking advantage of is the glitch high jump. When you hold down square after swinging your cane, Sly will charge up this spinning attack. If you try to charge this attack while in midair, you can achieve a grounded standpoint that you can jump off of, essentially allowing you to triple jump. Sly 2 now had horizontal movement tech in the form of square boosting, and vertical movement tech in the form of glitch high jumping, allowing the game to be pushed to new heights. And lengths. As for strats, Gnist performed an absolutely ridiculous trick in breaking and entering, known as a table clip. By using the charge attack once again and interrupting it with entering a crawl space, Sly will clip into the table for a brief moment. Once inside the table, you have a ton of speed, and you can clip through the gates on the other side. But you need to be careful to cancel this speed at a very precise moment, or the game will launch you out of bounds. If done successfully, you can skip the entire cutscene with Murray and save about 25 seconds. The table clip had been known about for at least a year, but nobody was daring enough to put it in a run until Gnist. The trick is notoriously inconsistent, and would cause plenty of resets early on, but 25 seconds was way too good to pass up. Gnist had a comparison against Cooper Crisp's 3232, and you can see that he gains massive time over him after completing the job. On Bug Dimitri's office, Gnist used the glitch high jump to his advantage, cutting the corner even sharper to the ventilation shaft, saving another four and a half. He maintains the lead through the run, all the way up until silence the alarms, where he tragically only gets a single briefcase spawn, which costs him half his lead. Gnist also gained about two seconds on Disco Demolitions by hitting the bomb on the final pillar, skipping the necessary wait for the detonation. Gnist's run was good, but he was definitely carried by a game-breaking new strategy. And so, he wanted to prove that it wasn't a fluke. He would set a 3209 11 days later, and in March, the 32-minute barrier would be shattered. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. I'm gonna retime that last split because I split late, I think. This run only really had one new notable strat, that being this vent clip at the end of breaking and entering that saves a couple of seconds. Besides that, this run was really solid. The square boosts were looking crispier, the briefcases were on his side this time, and a good Dimitri fight to close it out. The community around this time was relatively small with only 14 submitted runs to the episode 1 leaderboards. Gnist would start streaming his runs a lot more often, bringing in a small loyal fan base for Sly. At the end of the month, March 30th, Gnist would squeeze out another 3 second record, to 3140. <laughs> that, was a, that was a late split, but... One of the people that was watching this run was Cuber, who was inspired to get back to the game, just to see if he still had it in him to reclaim the title. Cuber had improved his personal best to a 3208, but wanted to push into that 31 territory. He learned the table clip, all the small new optimizations, and all the new movement tech. He was hot on Gnist's heels. He had a run on April 19th that was 16 seconds behind Gnist going into Dimitri. It seemed like a lost cause, perhaps good enough for a new personal best, but not quite good enough for the record. Regardless, Cuber gave it everything he had. A 3140, a world record tie to the second, a rare sight to behold. Oh, my heart hurts. The gang and I headed out of town for a week in Monaco. Oh. I figured the team had earned themselves. Cuber had proven to the world, but most importantly to himself, that he could still play at the top level. 
even if it seemed like NIST was becoming harder and harder to reach. And that statement could not be more true. GNIST was in the lab trying to find more ways to save time for episode 1. We're entering the stage where tiny tiny optimizations start to matter. One second here, two seconds there, will add up over the course of the run. All the jobs in the episode are fairly simple and straightforward, and serve to show you the ropes of the game. With simplicity comes extreme optimization, and optimizations are exactly what GNIST would implement. He would post a run a mere two days after Cuber tied his record, and already within the first few seconds of the run, a new strat would be unearthed. And this one wasn't one to two seconds. The Satellite Sabotage Cutscene Skip When you begin the run, Sly will climb to the rooftop automatically, as seen in previous instances. Right before he pulls out the Binocucom, you have a one frame window to press start to pause the game. Since Sly 2 runs at 60 frames per second, that's a 60th of a second you have to press a single button. However, there was a workaround to make this consistent. All you have to do is follow the great words of Melee commentator Homemade Waffles. A pocket controller, dog! A pocket controller! Yes, that is the strat. Unplugging the charger cord from your controller will pause the game on the first frame possible. Unplugging it right when Sly latches off the pipe makes the controller re-establish wireless connection to the PS3 at the perfect moment for you to gain control in the pause menu. Now you can quit out to the episode menu and re-enter, and the cutscene will be skipped. A tad controversial, perhaps, but we'll take the 12 seconds. Besides this massive save, Gnist would also table clip through the second laser barrier in breaking and entering, which skips crawling under the table. A tiny shortcut was found by using this window's flower bed combined with a glitch high jump to reach the window earlier for Bug Dimitri's office. And a closer rooftop was used to take care of the rats when getting the repair truck key in the operation. Cuber's method of running all the way back was pretty slow, but much safer as you knock the rat off of a higher rooftop, guaranteeing an instant kill. Gnist's method, while faster, requires more finesse to get right. Gnist had actually been using this strat since his first world record for episode 1 months back, but this was the first time he nailed it to perfection. Now, it was just about closing it out. Hey, I did it. My sum of best is now sub-31, by far, Kappa. Um, I can still be a lot faster though. Like, I still lost uh, almost 10 seconds to Cuber on the last split. Uh, so that can still be improved. Despite getting a best segment on the operation, Gnist still lost 10 seconds to Cuber. This was largely due to Cuber's better execution in the boss fight against Dimitri, but it's not as simple as it looks. Allow me to break it down. You'll always start the fight at the opposite end from Dimitri, where he will shoot a laser attack with his ring. You're normally supposed to take cover when he shoots this until his ring jams, but he'll also stop using this attack if you close the gap. Once you're up close, you need to hit Dimitri four times for the first knockdown, four times again for the second one, and after doing it a third time, he will teleport. The teleporting was a bit of a mystery back in the early days, but it was slowly figured out around this time in April 2015. The fight arena is separated into four quadrants. Dimitri will always teleport diagonally across from the quadrant that Sly is standing in, so if you want to fight him well, you can knock him down, then get as close to the center of the arena while still standing inside of the same quadrant, then run to the opposite one once Dimitri has teleported. While both Gnist and Cuber had a stranglehold over the strategy, Cuber would typically pull better times. Brilliantly showcased in his 3113, which was set the very next day after Gnist's new time. A gold split to close, and a new world record. Woo woo. 31-13, boys. Thank you, Gniston. Oh, I get to move on. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so fucking happy. <laughs> For the first time in the Twitch era, Sly 2 Episode 1 would remain dormant. Cuber's 3113 would stay on top for half a year, a great statement for the final record of the game's early champion.
Hubert would still root for future record holders and stick around in the community to race and do some occasional runs, but this would be the last time he was in first place. His work here was done. We thank you, Cuber. The 3113 was gonna fall eventually, and the person to beat it is someone I've mentioned before. Mikkel. For the love of God, don't hit me. Oh, this is so dangerous. Fuck. <gasps> what the fuck? <laughs> Coming hot off his any percent record in Sly 1, Mikkel wanted to see if he could end the dry streak on episode 1. He had the speed, he had the pace, and surely enough, he would get it by a mere two seconds. Nope. I got it. I'm so, so sorry, Cuber. Your first instinct might be that he's apologizing to Cuber for ending his record's long streak, but there's a little more to it. It's not a PlayStation speedrunning video if we don't talk about loading times. Playing with a physical disc of the Sly Collection is slower than having the game downloaded on your PS3, so a digital release is always used. The different PS3 models vary heavily on the reset times after each day in the episode. The oldest models of PlayStation 3s, being the fat A through K models, are the fastest, which is strange to say the least. You would think that the newer models with stronger hardware are better suited for running, but the fat L through Q models are slower, the slim models are even slower, and the super slim models are horrendously slow. Finally, there is some variation in loading times depending on the hard disk drive you have in your PS3. The standard one always has 5400 revolutions per minute, or RPM. Mikkel had replaced his standard hard disk drive with a newer one, for storage reasons, but this one had an RPM of 7200, which caused him to save 2-3 seconds on Cuber and Gnist on every quit out to the PS3 menu. To equalize the playing field from here on out, it made much more sense to just ditch hard disk drives altogether, and upgrade to solid state drives. PS3s can't read or write more than 300 megabytes per second from any drive, so even the cheapest SSDs, at $30 or so, wouldn't be faster than a more expensive one. This would become the new standard, so runs never had to come down to faster loads ever again. However, at the time, Cuber's run had better execution over Mikkel's, and they both knew it. Mikkel's run was still the record, but SSDs opened the door for way lower to be possible, as it saved around 23 seconds for episode 1. Who was going to take advantage of that? When the world needed him the most, Gnist came back. With an SSD at his disposal, he was ready to leap far ahead of the competition. He had already proven himself as a force to be reckoned with in Sly 2, and for the next year of the game's history, no man could touch the Norwegian Slayer. With his 3025 set on November 27th, 2015, Gnist had officially swept the entire episode leaderboard for Sly 2. There's no rule stating that you can't set an individual episode record in a full game run, and Gnist was such a monster, he would do exactly that. Thirty twelve, an absolute takeover of the game. SSD only saved around 23 seconds, yet Gnist had bettered his place so much throughout the months that he shaved off a whole minute. Despite being so close to breaking the 30 minute barrier, Gnist was satisfied with how far he had pushed the game. And who could blame him? He had firmly cemented his position at the top of the leaderboard. He had everything. What more could he want?
Well, one thing is getting the lead, another is maintaining it. And you may notice that a new player already has a 30 of his own. This is Alekhine, and throughout 2016, he was comfortably sitting behind Gnist in second place. A Norwegian rival hungry to take the number one spot for himself. Towards the end of 2016, Alec wanted to make a push for the full game any percent record, as it was starting to be viewed with more prestige over episode times. But he had a way to go if he wanted to get there, and decided instead to improve all of his episode times for practice. Alec is a former RuneScape skiller. He's no stranger to relentless grinding for hours on end. The word goes that Alec would enter the double digits some days during his most motivated times. He's Sly 2's first proper grind monkey, if you can put it that way. Shown here in his natural habitat. To achieve first place in the full game, Alec wanted to get the world record, or at least get very close to it, in every single episode. What better way than to start from the beginning? And Alec was set on the grand prize. Sub 30 in episode 1. Gnist had a couple of new strategies showcased in his 3012, and a sub 30 was proven to be barely possible with a very clean run. The first strat takes place in water pump destruction, where using the invincibility frames from the laser enables you to punch out the second alarm, rather than tossing items at it. A nifty little barrier skip allows for a few seconds of time save in disco demolitions, and finally, a faster and more consistent strat for the truck key was discovered in the operation. By destroying this bench near the fountain, you alert the two rats that are tailing behind the truck guard. As they leave their position to check on the noise, you can quickly run to the left to avoid detection, and steal the key very quickly. Alec had improved his 3045 to a 3018, and was now so tantalizingly close to both Gnist and the sub-30. On November 13th, 2016, Alec was on the run. He hit all three table clips in breaking and entering. He got three briefcases on Silence the Alarms. A four second gold split in theater pickpocketing. It was all just looking a little too good to be true. In the operation, Alec nailed the guard lure for the truck key, hit the cockstrats, and had a great fight against the rats. He was 20 seconds ahead of Gnist going into Dimitri. This run was so good, there was even a little bit of room to spare. The nerves were getting to Alec, and it showed in his fight against Dimitri. It was shaky. He was making mistakes. It was gonna be close. There it was, 29.59. Alec had pulled through and achieved the sub-30 by the skin of his teeth. It took a lot of effort from many of the game's glitch hunters and community members, but episode one could now be beaten in under half an hour. All in the name of Norway. Alec would go on to chase down great times in the other episodes as well. He got the record in episode 7, episode 8, episode 4, and eventually was only missing episode 6 for the sweep, which he would get during a full game run in February. As a fun side note, Gnist would take back the episode 6 record the very next day, meaning that Alec only had the episode sweep for 24 hours. Regardless though, Alec was more focused on any percent, and treated the episode records as more of necessary practice for full game. Once he began his full game grind, he would add another improvement to episode 1 during one of his attempts, with 2950. Gnist didn't have much time to play in the winter season due to exams, but in March, he was ready to come back to reclaim the records that Alec had taken over the months. And what's more, he had finally obtained the optimal fat PS3 setup, now putting him on the same playing field as Alec. On March 10th, he set a new record of 2944 for episode 1. This run had two new small strategy innovations. Z had figured out that the first cutscene on Disco Demolitions could be skipped, by getting knocked into the cutscene trigger by whacking your own bomb and dying on the way in. 
You would think this would save massive amounts of time, as the cutscene is 22 seconds long. But you have to redo the first room again with the lasers, reducing the time save to only 2 seconds. Sly 2 has long been plagued with unskippable cutscenes throughout the game, so skips like these are very welcome additions to the run. The other strat Ganist would incorporate in this run is absolutely ridiculous, and would take place outside of the window for Bug Dimitri's office. Gnist didn't climb the pipe, he didn't jump off the window, no. Gnist went for the chair. Despite the chair jump, the rest of the run was fairly solid. Enough for a new record by 6 seconds, that would last for 9 months. For the rest of 2017, episode 1 was left in the dust. Alec had properly burnt himself out after spending hours every day playing any percent. It's not easy to maintain motivation for a 5 hour long game. Gnist had shifted his focus to Sly 2 100% in May of 2017 and then to Sly 3 any percent in September. Towards the end of the year, we would see some new faces get close to the Norwegians, but no new record. With how optimized episode 1 was getting, no one was willing to make a push to lower the time. A new player had to step up, or something new had to be found. To continue our story, I need to talk about a certain someone. This guy right here. His name is Augurino, or Augie. And he's... sort of the class clown of the community. Okay, so it's here. It's like you stand like here. But it's me- Where do you think Augie's from? Yeah, another Norwegian. Look at the leaderboards in November 2017. Literally, the entire top 7 runners are Norwegian or Finnish. What is this, some black metal fan gathering or something? Anyway, there is actually a solid explanation as to why this is the case. For most smaller nations in Europe, you would just have to play the game in English, since translations were hard to come by. Sly 2 and 3, however, came with a ton of languages. Not just your usual English, German, Spanish, and French. Sly 2 also came with Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, Finnish, Dutch, Italian, Portuguese, and Japanese. For many of the Nordic countries, having games in our native tongues was extremely unusual. And here comes a game as big as Sly 2 in 12 different languages. Thanks for that sucker punch. It was a big deal, and the games were extremely popular here for this reason. Augie and a few other people had been testing different languages in Sly 2 to see if it would make a difference in the run. Some episodes in Sly 3 were faster in Dutch and Norwegian, so surely something had to be better for Sly 2. After some testing, a few things were found out. The difference between every language was basically negligible in comparison to English, but there was one exception. Augie and another runner Swappy are both collectors of various versions of the Sly games, but there was one version that eluded them for quite some time. Korean. Obtaining a Korean copy of Sly 2 wasn't the easiest feat, but Swappy managed to get his hands on one. The moment he slid the disc in, it was night and day. The dialogue here is unreasonably fast. It seems that some of the cutscene footage is shortened because the Korean dialogue is so fast that it wouldn't match up with the length used for English. After another runner, Remo, timed Korean over English for the whole game, it was proven to be an astonishing 9 minutes faster for any percent. One of these minutes being in episode 1. Augie was able to crack the final piece of the puzzle and figured out how to get a Korean downloaded copy of the game on PS3 and forwarded the information to the community. This would mark the beginning of the Korean gold rush in Sly 2. A single discovery so impactful, the records for all of the game's 8 individual episodes, as well as any percent, were now up for grabs. For episode 1, anybody that was decently within range of Gnist before now had a shot at getting an easy record and Augie would get his 48 hours of fame, setting a new world record with Korean, on December 22nd, 2017, with 29.22.
Two days later on Christmas Eve, Mikkel was doing full game runs with Korean, and just so happened to get one too, with 29-15. Remo, who was the big mastermind behind timing the Korean dialogue, would get a Gold Rush world record of his own, by one second, 29-14. Within the span of less than a week, three different players had set three different records. It seemed like it was anybody's game, but Papa Gnist had something else to say about it. Huh. Those are some nice times, boys. How about 28-33? Yeah, everybody sort of saw this coming. When Gnist got a hold of Korean, it was game over. This time came with only one new notable strat that Augie had used in his run. Sly one runner Zenthro figured out a double hit method for certain guards, which could be used for the rat fight in the operation. After a regular square attack, the rats normally have to get up from the ground but you can fit in a triangle attack as the rats are getting back up, resulting in more damage per second. The only downside is that if you miss the timing, you'll get hit by the rat's kick on the way back up. The next month, Gnist would be back with another improvement, lowering the record by 4 seconds, just by playing slightly better throughout. The overall mentality for Sly 2 runners entering 2018 was shifting away from the early days. Back when the community was smaller scale in 2014, the focus was more on episode runs. They were the perfect length to race and have fun with your friends, and full game runs were simply too long. Over 6 hours. Now, 4 years later, the full game record is close to breaking the 5 hour barrier. While still a long run, it could now be justified to take seriously, due to the growing popularity of Twitch streaming. Sitting in your room and doing a 5 hour long run by yourself can be pretty mind numbing, but now, Twitch chat is here to keep you company. It's interesting to see this shift in viewpoints, from episode runs reigning supreme, and full game runs being kind of irrelevant, to it now being the other way around. Alec was sort of the first person to adopt this mentality, and others would follow in his footsteps for a long time. As full game runs became more relevant, it drew in more viewership for Sly, and expanded the community by a lot. The episode 1 leaderboard now had runs from 60 different people. A lot of this can be attributed to Gnist for streaming the Sly games consistently over the years. Many viewers find his stream comfy. He never rages, is helpful if people have questions about the game, and is just a very wholesome person overall. Augie has on countless occasions snuggled up and fallen asleep to his stream. On top of all of that, he's definitely one of the most accomplished Sly runners ever. It was very tough to take the record from Gnist. And when you did, he would always come back to reclaim it. The only person who was seemingly in sight to compete for the episode 1 record was Remo, who was 24 seconds behind Gnist. So far in this video, Remo has been portrayed as the guy who timed Korean for Sly 2 and got a free record with it. But in the background, this Finnish juggernaut was absolutely dominating Sly 3, setting one world record after another. The games have some small differences, but the fundamentals remain the same. The saying goes, if you're good at one, you're probably going to be good at the other. And throughout January of 2018, Remo and Gnist would have a heated battle for the Sly 2 any percent record. No episode 1 records were set during the big showdown, besides the 28-29 by Gnist. Remo took a break from speedrunning around mid-2018, so Gnist was once again left without a competitor. The only records that would be set for the next while would be far apart from one another, and would basically just happen when Gnist decided to de-rust for full game. 28-25 in July 2018, 28-22 in April 2019, 28-20 just hours later, and 28-11 two days after that. Besides better execution overall, the strats in this run were wildly different from before. A small revolution was taking place for strat hunting, and a new strategy on Follow Dimitri is the first big eye catcher, as Gnist would do this. He teleported across the map. Follow Dimitri is more or less an auto-scroller where your only goal is to not get spotted by anyone, but this time can be better spent. Gnist makes sure he doesn't go too far away from Dimitri's radius to fail the job, but moves in a precise way in order to set up a super jump. If you move around by jumping and swinging the cane when you're about to hit the ground, a value that the game uses to keep track of your position is never updated, and when you fall in water or off a high area, the game will move you back to the last place this value was written. 
Gnist purposefully sets his position next to the red car, and retains this during the entirety of Fall of Dimitri, taking advantage of breakable objects, including this antenna which also doesn't update your position. He waits on this railing for the job to complete, and then jumps into the water, which teleports him all the way back to the car. This allows him to start Bug Dimitri's office immediately after, effectively changing the route and swapping the two jobs around entirely. In breaking and entering, Gnist uses double hits and specific pathing to group the rats into the same location, allowing Murray to absolutely pulverize them, then table clipping only seconds later. On Silence the Alarms, a huge discovery was made that eliminated the painful randomness on the second alarm. It turns out that the briefcases don't spawn randomly, but spawn based on the camera, which means they can be manipulated, just like the guards. All you have to do is make sure you're not touching the camera running through this fountain area, and that you're running in a specific path. You'll get three or four briefcases every time. In theater pickpocketing, Gnist went back to the old strat for the first key, since it was now faster with another lure, by slamming this chair at the start. The amount of coins you have to dig for in order to get the keys in this job is also random, and is time loss that starts to matter with the run now so optimized. With Korean dialogue saving time all throughout the game, Gnist opted to not do the Disco Demolitions cutscene skip, since it almost broke even with watching the cutscene. This run also features by far the best Dimitri fight we've seen, spending as little time as possible not doing damage. The 2811 was an incredible run. Gnist had now been running Sly 2 for over four years, and was still trying to push the boundaries. His records did come with some notable dead periods in between, and his life as a whole was taking on more responsibilities, school being the main time consumer. Despite all of that, a lot has happened in very little time. Sub-30 didn't even feel like it was achieved all that long ago, but now we're closing in on Sub-28. The question was, was it going to be Gnist? Or someone else? In the summer of 2019, Remo had come back from his break. And this time, he was serious about Sly 2. Remo started out posting his first Sly 3 runs in the summer of 2017, but over the years, would quickly gather a reputation for being meticulous. If he finds a new strategy, he will test it. If a new route is brought to his attention, he will time it. And if there's records out there for the taking, he will take them. Remo is a living Sly speedrunning library. You could ask him how much the fastest strat saves for a certain job in, I don't know, episode 5, and you bet he's got the answer. Not only that, he's also an incredibly consistent runner, and gets results very fast. In June of 2019, Remo would absolutely demolish the entire episode leaderboard for Sly 2 within the span of a few weeks, even faster than Alec back in 2017. Remo really wanted to go for a feat that nobody had done before, the elusive 19 out of 19, meaning every episode record for 80% and 100%, the full game record for 80% and 100%, and a miscellaneous category called Any Percent with Cheats. To be fair, he already had every 100% record for every episode, so he wasn't starting from zero. But still, it's difficult to describe how quickly Remo got some of these times. Already halfway through the month, he had 18 out of the 19 records, and it's no coincidence that he saved the most fitting for last. And I don't think I have to tell you which one it is. Remo barely had any new strategies to use. For the most part, he just had to try to keep up with Gnist for 28 minutes. For the table clip in breaking and entering, Remo got flung high up into the air, wasting around 5 seconds early on. But he was confident the time could be saved later. After all, for the 19 out of 19, Remo didn't need the run, he just needed a run. On Follow Dimitri, Remo didn't get teleported as far as Gnist, and had a horrible guard spawn as an even further punishment. Again, getting hit with the painting on your back causes you to fail the job, but Remo managed to escape the jaws of death, and nailed the chair jump right afterwards. At the end of Moonlight Rendezvous, Remo was 11 seconds behind Gnist, so at this point, he had to pull all the tricks out the bag to save as much time as possible. A reverse order for the last two keys in theater pickpocketing, the Disco Demolitions cutscene skip, and a much riskier water tower in the operation. Entering Dimitri, Remo found himself at the complete opposite end of where Alec was just two and a half years prior. He had closed the gap to being only three seconds behind Gnis, but he was going up against one of the best Dimitri fights in the world. But then, something happened. A miracle 
had struck for Remo. In a stroke of luck, when it was least expected, Dimitri had pushed Sly to the absolute perfect spot as he was teleporting, closing out a new world record for Remo of 2808 and completing the full 19 out of 19 sweep. Finland was now on top, Remo was the king of Sly 3, and now was the king of Sly 2. Hands down, one of the greatest the series has ever seen. Throughout this mid-2019 period, Remo seemed completely unstoppable. He was like a train with no brakes, setting record after record. 4, 58, the day the 2808 was set would also mark the day of Gnist's final time at the top for episode 1. He had done a lot for the community for the past 4 years, setting countless records in Sly 2 and 3, but life goes on. Having said that, you never know when we might see him play again. It could happen. We'll have to wait and see. Remo had taken the Sly scene by storm, and had the stranglehold over two of the games. He was looking like the one to push for the sub-28, but episode one was taking its toll. To put it blunt, nobody cared to push it down further with how optimized it was. If you didn't play within a few seconds of perfection, you would have to start over. Your runs could die in so many different ways, and no one was willing to squeeze a lemon that seemingly had no juice left. Let's rewind the tape a bit, because we have been going for quite a while at this point. These were the top 10 players on the leaderboards right when Gnist got his final record. I figured we should, you know, reflect a bit. We got Remo, who was catching up quickly. We have Swappy, Mikkel, Augie, Alec, you know, the goon squad. But we also have some new runners amongst the top. I want to talk about this guy down here, tied for 10th place. Hexu, with a 29.53. A sub-30 is certainly a respectable time, but something definitely stands out with this run. You see, when you submit your time to the leaderboards, you're required to put in your time, your hard drive, your starting gadgets, which is none for episode 1, your platform and version, and date. Hexu's 2953 was done on English, and he also wasn't using an SSD. If you do the math, his time with optimal hardware would be in the mid-28 minute range very clearly a top 3 player in terms of skill. He had been playing on and off since 2016, and found various strategies throughout the game. The guard lure used in the operation was found by him, and the crazy super jump chain on Follow Dimitri as well. Many community members speculated about the potential of Hexu. He could definitely be a world record contender if he acquired the right version of the game, but the man himself was a bit of a mystery. He barely interacted at all with the community, and was just off doing his own thing. If he was playing, you had no idea. You would just have to wait until he submitted a run to see what kind of times he was getting. Hexu became the talking point in the community Discord server. Just who the hell was this mysterious player? Has anyone spoken to him before? What does he look like? People just like imagine him being like this super big brolic dude. And then, you know, the, 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 I don't know what it's called, but it's like the brolic doge started popping up as, in, as a meme, and we were like, that's fucking Hexu. That is Hexu. Okay, so if we take Augie's description to heart, we have a big muscular dog who plays with no help from the community, and is one of the players with the highest skill potential. Don't give this guy Korean an SSD, or he might just destroy your game. But that's exactly what would happen. The community was about to witness something legendary. The Finnish hurricane had arrived. Let's see what he could do. Show your bling and let me shine you. We smooth. Look, see the money. Your life, the money, the money, the money. Yeah. 
the juice. Smooth. Dig the kinetic. Kinetic is static. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to keep it smooth. Twenty-seven thirty-four. Hexu had pushed episode one to a place where it had never been before. Not only did he break into the twenty-seven minute barrier on his first world record, he continued to lower it when everyone else thought that there was no more time to be saved. What an absolute beast. Hexu had shaved off twenty seconds from Remo's record with nothing but better movement and execution. But his twenty-seven thirty-four did have a completely new innovation: gadgets. Something I've never brought up because it's simply never been relevant is the gadgets menu, which you can open by pressing select. New gadgets are added into this menu with every episode, but you have to purchase them in the safe house. In episode one, there's only one gadget that each playable character can obtain. Fists of Flame for Murray, Smoke Bomb for Sly, and Trigger Bomb for Bentley. Hexu had discovered that the items in episode one could help save a tiny amount of time in the run, but where was he gonna get the coins? Hexu spent his time wisely during the auto-scroller jobs to farm 200 coins to buy the Trigger Bomb for Bentley, which saved a handful of seconds in Disco Demolitions. The Trigger Bomb is a bomb you can manually detonate, but it will also detonate if you leave a certain radius around it. So Hexu throws a Trigger Bomb on the first pillar, he then makes his way to the second pillar, and quickly drops a bomb as he leaves the radius of the Trigger Bomb. This causes the cutscenes to overlap and play at the same time, saving time over playing them individually. He then continues to do the same for the third and fourth one, including a ballsy corner cut over the archway. Hexu's gameplay throughout this run is also unbelievably clean. A disgusting triple hit in breaking and entering from Murray, perfect camera manipulation to get four briefcases, and insane rat juggling in the operation, all in the same run. This is perhaps where the record should have stood, but a rule change was in the works for Sly 2. Full game runs for Sly 2 was being revolutionized by the use of additional gadgets, such as Adrenaline Burst and Stealth Slide, saving huge amounts of time in the later stages of the game. At this point, episode runs were only allowed to start with the gadgets that were required to complete the episode, which in the case of episode 1, is none. Additional gadgets could be bought if the coins were grinded mid-run, as Hexu did in his 2734. But in order to prevent episode runs, especially later in the game, from being completely left behind in the midst of the gadget revolution, the community was pulled, and a decision was made. Additional gadgets were now allowed for Sly 2 episode runs. Runners could begin the run with any available gadgets that are already unlocked by that point in the game. Which means that Hexu had one last run to do. On September 8th, 2020, the Sly community witnessed history. It was pure beauty between a man and his game. From a strategy and gameplay point of view, this is the peak. Hexu would start the attempt that would go on to be the most well-executed display for Episode 1. Here we go. First, Hexu uses some advanced movement tech throughout the rooftops of Paris. The charge attack's grounded speed is slightly faster than normal running speed, and you can keep this speed by timing a square boost right when the charge attack ends, saving tiny tiny amounts of time. Hexu nails this movement and gets a gold split for the segment. After follow Dimitri, Hexu takes the super jump chain one step further, and warps directly into the trigger for Bug Dimitri's office. He nails the chair jump, and goes for an absolutely insane jump to the ventilation shaft. Cooper, Cooper Crisp and Z had tried for countless hours to get this jump to work a single time back in the day. But now in 2020, Hexu does it effortlessly. He keeps up the pace and gets three briefcases on Silence the Alarms with camera manipulation. With a three second lead, Hexu goes for a new 50-50 cutscene skip in theater pickpocketing. If you remember from way back earlier in the video, Sly will sometimes walk forward all the way into the cutscene. Sometimes he will stop short. For you to be able to skip this cutscene, you need Sly to stop short. 
which is about a 50% chance, adding a pretty big run killer towards the end of episode 1. After getting lucky on the coin flip, Hexu uses the newly acquired smoke bomb to lure the flashlight guard to the door, where he then skips the cutscene by dying as it's playing, saving around 8 seconds. The first room in Disco Demolitions is done faster than it's ever been done before. Hexu damage boosts while disabling the first laser barrier, then pulls a bomb and whacks it mid-air, allowing it to roll forwards into the second one. After quickscoping the guard, he perfectly times a jump into the second barrier, right as it goes down, and pulls another bomb to die for the cutscene skip. I'm just gonna let you see this one more time at full speed. For the fourth time in this video, a new strat was discovered for getting the truck key in the operation, but the only one mad enough to go for it is Hexu. All that to save 0.1 seconds. With one final showdown against Dimitri, Hexu uses the smoke bomb to completely revolutionize the fight. When you hit guards while undetected, you will get an instant knockdown, but if you're detected, they will stay on their feet. Hexu realized that you can utilize the smoke bomb to be undetected by Dimitri, and thus get a free instant knockdown after just one hit. Hexu prevents him from teleporting away completely by cornering him with this strat. He tears through the entire boss fight in mere seconds. Twenty seven twelve. A record that stood, no, a record that is still standing over a year later. A masterful display from the game's best player. And as expected, Hexu, soon after getting this run, slowly faded back into his mysterious ways, and it would be a while until we heard from him again. According to Slygolds.com, which is a website that tracks all the best times for each job, you can see that the community's best possible episode 1 adds up to 2701. If we take these numbers literally, Hexu is 11 seconds away from perfection. In more realistic eyes though, a 26 will definitely happen. Whether it's Hexu, Remo, Gnist, or maybe a new player, only time will tell. Man, what a journey it's been for the Sly community. It all started out with a bunch of passionate fans of the game on Speed Demo's archive in 2008. And throughout the years, the community has grown so much, and the time has fallen so low. From Cooper Crisp's early runs, to Cuber's love for the episode, to racing on Speedruns Live, to Gnist taking over the game, to Alex sub-30, to Augie's laughter, to Remo's 19 out of 19, and to Hexu's silent obliteration. From the bottom of my heart, thank you to all the runners, glitch hunters, modders, and casual players for keeping this game alive. And of course, to viewers like yourself for making it this far into the video. On the surface, this may just seem like the history of how Episode 1's record has been lowered over the years, but a true community has been built and grown for these games that consists of friendships, laughs, memes, sadness, and joy. With 121 runs on speedrun.com for episode 1, there's no better time than now to get into speedrunning Sly 2. It's as easy as putting on a timer and just playing as fast as you can. After saying the word episode 1 42 times in this video, I'm starting to want to try too. The best thing you can do to get into speedrunning any game out there is to go to speedrun.com, search for the game, and join the community discord. There, you will find people that are willing to help you get started. As for the future of the game, Hexu hasn't been very active as of late, and a few new players are catching up to him. His any% percent record is being pursued by two new players, Jake and Beaver, who are only behind by a few minutes. Hexu also had a stranglehold over all the episodes, but due to inactivity, Beaver and Phobos have managed to snag a couple. However, episode 1 is still firmly in Hexu's grasp, with second place being Beaver 29 seconds behind. After all these years, we finally have a player who cares about the full game run and the individual episodes. 
combining the mindset from both new and old. There are a couple of tool-assisted strategies and theories that have circulated for episode 1, so let's take a look at them before closing things out. The first one is this possible sequence break uploaded by Gnist in 2017. Gnist uses the paraglider and the binocucom to clip out of the final room during breaking and entering. You wouldn't normally have the paraglider here, but let's just pretend you can get out somehow. You can actually hurt Dimitri and knock him down during this part, but the game crashes. Something in the game realizes that you haven't fulfilled the prerequisites for this to happen, and it breaks the code. Essentially, there are flags that need to be hit in order to proceed to later parts of the game. For example, in breaking and entering, you would think that the table clip can launch you high into the air, and you could just skip to the end. But there's a trigger you need to hit around the first laser wall. Otherwise, the game won't progress. These triggers are spread all throughout the game, some smaller scale for individual jobs, and some larger scale for the whole episode, which makes it harder to find major sequence breaks. Chaining square boosts on slopes can result in some pretty ridiculous speeds, showcased here in a tool-assisted run-through of Satellite Sabotage by Hexu. This is possible in a real-time setting with some extreme precision, and could elevate the game's movement to its highest echelon scene yet. And one final Mad Lad strat that saves around 10 seconds if done perfectly, is this rat fight skip for the operation, uploaded by Hexu in 2019. It's not in the best quality, and it's pretty complicated, but I'll try my best to break it down. During the section where you're supposed to climb the peacock, you can set up a super jump chain from a standpoint on this pipe, and carry it all the way over to the water. In order for the game to save on memory, the game deloads some of the objects across the map, and by falling into the water far enough away, Sly will respawn on the pipe and it will be deloaded. Now here's the complicated bit. If Sly or the camera leaves the radius of the standpoint a second time, it deloads the floor for the entire map, giving the trick its name, Fake Floor. After climbing the peacock, the camera pans over to Bentley and Murray stealing the truck, which is far enough away from the pipe to trigger the fake floor. This causes both Sly and the rats that spawn for the fight to fall through the world, but you can just barely keep Sly alive with enough health. Getting every single rat to despawn on the map is incredibly inconsistent, and also, Sly jumping far enough into the loading trigger for the next part can take several attempts too, and is out of your control. Only a couple of people have saved time with this skip, including Remo during an episode 1 attempt in June 2019. Nobody has set a new record with this, but perhaps this is how we'll see a 26 minute time happen. All the power to anyone willing to take it there. The Sly Cooper series is something that means a lot to some people around the world. Memories about the games from younger years are left by some as mere relics of the past. But a strong community chose to take matters into their own hands, and forge a path forward for a game they held extremely dear. Episode 1 has seen revolutionary changes over the past 7 years. It all started as a straightforward tutorial level, but passionate players from far and wide have turned it into something greater. Movement tech, glitches, and shortcuts all contribute to elevating it into another frontier. It's Sly 2's most iconic episode, but I think now, it's safe to say that it's also Sly 2's most competitive episode. No other category in the Sly series has the size that episode 1 continues to hold, and very few records have a bar that's been set this high. We've come a long way, but I believe there's still more to go. For anyone daring to take the time down further, good luck, and au revoir. Thanks for watching, and a special thanks to everyone who was just shown on screen in the credits. And a massive thanks to my patrons for making videos like these possible. 
A behind-the-scenes interview with Augie is available for all $5 backers. As always, take care and have a good one.